welcome to a, a conversation with the uh, Five Solus Films, and I'm really excited to go literally halfway around the world. I'm in California. We're going to go to Cambodia, and I want you to meet a new friend of mine. His name is Tyler Van Halteren. Did I say that right, Tyler? You got it, man. That's the Dutch Dutch name. Thanks, Tyler. And there are harder Dutch names out there, so I'm glad it wasn't the, one of the harder like Frisian names. <laughs> Thanks for uh, joining us here on, on this conversation. You uh, have written a book called uh, Little Pilgrim's Big Journey, based on Pilgrim's Progress. Um, this is my copy that I ordered in your Kickstarter campaign, and uh, yeah. we really enjoy it. it. It's just a great little book. Um, so the next few minutes together, I just want to kind of talk with you about the, the, the idea, where it came from, the process of creating it, and so forth. But first, you're in Cambodia. You're you're working as a missionary in Cambodia. In Cambodia, tell us a little bit about how the Lord took you there and and what you guys are doing as, as you minister there. Yeah, so I think pretty shortly after I got saved, God gave me a passion for His Word, for evangelism, and then I just started to pray. Where can that best be used? And set my sights on the nations, mainly just by the the drastic needs uh, in terms of unreached people groups, lack of training. And so over time, as I gained experience in ministry, went to seminary, uh, started to feel that the greatest need was training pastors, training leaders overseas. And so that led us to Cambodia, where the church is uh, very young. It's, they endured a horrible genocide in the 70s, and then were under communism for a long time. So missionaries came basically in the 90s, and that's when the church began. And the Bible was first translated in like, 1960s so everything Christianity is very young here less than two percent Christians and so that was uh, since God calling us here partnering with a good team that had uh, similar theology similar convictions philosophy so uh, that's how God brought us to Cambodia and now now I'm teaching at a, a Bible college here is the main uh, main focus part of your team is also working on translating Bibles, or not Bibles, uh, books that are in English or other language, mm -hmm. perhaps, but probably primarily English, and bringing them into the Cambodian language. Is that is that something you're involved with as well? Yeah, not currently, um, but it is something I'll probably be dabbling in, especially like we're, we're talking about translating this book in potentially into a bit of a, like a YouTube kind of video, like with just mild light animation of the pages. And, uh, and they're, yeah, they're doing some great work. They did uh, the Jesus Storybook Bible recently, which is phenomenal. I use that to teach some kids in a neighborhood near us, and uh, that's just a huge gift to have for, for this young church especially. Wow, that's wonderful. So Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, I, I think I, I heard about your book through a Facebook ad or a Kickstarter ad, and you know I, I think it was exactly this cover that I saw. I was oh, like, yeah. Oh, I really like the way that's illustrated. I'm curious and did a little investigation into who you were and what you were doing with your publishing company, Lithos Kids. Mm -hmm. um, I loved Pilgrim's Progress since I was a kid as well. Uh, it just, there's something captivating about the epicness of the tale, which I think a lot of kids are drawn towards. But yeah. then if you start to mature in your walk with Christ, you realize, man, this allegory goes deep. Like, this is the mm -hmm. Christian walk. Um, what was it for you that, that drew you to Pilgrim's Progress as a young person and then drew you back as, I want to I retell the story for kids today? Yeah, it's funny. My dad had a bookshelf with not many books, but there was the Pilgrim's Progress and it was a mass market. I think it says 75 cents on it from the 70s. So old, stained. I was like, oh, I'm a young Christian, picked it up, thought I want to start reading Christian books. And so I started going through it. And I guess the, the idea of the narrow path and the difficulties around every corner that Christian faces from every kind of angle, and then this perpetual journey uh, and perseverance towards a celestial city, that, that stuck with me. And that, that allegory has stuck with so many people, uh, that idea just pressing on in the narrow path. So that's that stuck with me as a young man, and now even more, yeah, has become richer and richer over the years. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, there have been many, many attempts over the years to uh, to to help children better understand it. Uh, it mm -hmm. Maybe read one. I know I read a couple different ones when I was younger. What really pressed on your heart? Like, I think this there's time for a new 
rendition yeah. tokens? Yeah, the one was I bought I bought Dangerous Journey, and uh, literally I wish I had a video. the The pictures of or a picture here, uh, Apollyon are like terrifying for me. And I opened it to my son. We got to that page, and I'm not joking. He began weeping like oh, it was <laughs> it's so terrifying. Um, and there's pictures of big skulls with eyeballs and things that are. So that, that was one, that language was a bit archaic and the uh, pictures were terrifying. And then the other versions I saw didn't, um, they'd follow the storyline, the main story points, but didn't actually get into the meat of discussions. Um, and in terms of the allegory, the some of the key points that characters would bring up, key dialogue. So I wanted to want, create one that would follow the story, but keep some of the richness of the themes in a way that kids could grasp, but would also be edifying to their parents and others who would read it. Uh, and I know what you mean. I, I have seen some artwork from Pilgrim's Progress that uh, uh, can be quite frightening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, it's funny. I was just looking before our interview at your Apollyon, and though he's a dragon and some something to be fearful of, uh, I, 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 it's not, it is uh, something that a four to 10 year old a, would not be, um, too scared of and yet yeah. realize okay i gotta be careful this one <laughs> yeah yeah it's interesting i've been thinking about this idea like creating deep meaningful stories for kids recently and my son has been on a veggie tales kick so <laughs> there's i didn't realize there's a lord of the beans which is a, a lord of the rings takeoff um and some some things about veggie tales i like some things that i don't don't love uh but the this one I was like oh this will be interesting so we watched it together but I felt like it it had ripped the soul and the heart out of the story uh, to make it like accessible for kids but I was like oh it didn't it didn't have to be that way like there right. could be real conflict there could be meaningful like dialogue there could be stakes uh, someone could die like things like that uh, that kids can they can handle that but uh, for some reason it it gets too dumbed down or it's yeah. made so simple that it's not meaningful anymore. And so with some of the children's versions that have been done, I felt felt that um, though they're beneficial parts, I feel like it missed the, the main thrust. Right, right. Now, when you think about John Bunyan's uh, original story, I mean, it is, it is so deep. I mean, he's got scores of characters, mm -hmm. scores of situations. How did you sit down and, and try to map out like, Okay, I, you know, I'm going to make this, as you just said, available for kids, but I don't want to, I don't want to strip the heart of the story out. Uh, did you create kind of like a storyline and say, okay, these guys I'm keeping in and well, we can lose these characters or how did you approach that process? Yeah. Yeah. The main uh, thing I did was go through and think, okay, what are the main themes? And he has it broken up into 10 stages, but it was kind of, what are the crucial encounters he has either with people or places and scenarios difficulties so i narrowed those down into chapters and then i thought of basically the the picture what each illustration would look like and kind of took bunyan's text and put it in there under each of those sort of main things so i'd go through create those and then i'd take that simplify it come back do it again try and keep and think what's the essence of what he's trying to communicate. So, so someone like talkative is a pretty random character. Uh, I almost took him out and then I sent it to a friend and he was like, Oh, you got to keep talkative in there. But talkative in the book, it might be like around 10 pages, for example, of a really, really nitty gritty and, and quite a genius dialogue, but kids wouldn't get any of it. But then it's just like, Oh, I'll take this character and make it someone who's just wanting to kind of blabber on, on the journey, isn't in a rush. He's just wanting to talk about anything or anyone and theorize. And so then in one page, you have this character talk of the encounter. And that's sort of, they say, the king wants us to live in, in deed and truth, not just in word and speech or so, something like that. They confront him and say, and he says, okay, I'm not in any rush. You guys are strange. You can go on your journey by yourselves. Wow. And so you, you're working through literally writing the the you know you're re you're looking at these ten stages you're looking at the the actual book itself you're writing your condensed version um, making some sketches it sounds like of what perhaps the illustration might look like 
but you're not the illustrator of it, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So did you have it all put together and then go look for your illustrator? Or as you were working on this, did you start the search for a talented uh, artist? Yeah, I'm pretty, um, what did you say? <laughs> like when I get an idea, I'm kind of like, it, go with it. So, so I started searching for an illustrator when I had that idea, which came from basically wanting to share it with my son, uh, who's four, and to have a meaningful version for him. Um, so started talking with illustrators. The internet is absolutely amazing. So I think like 150 people applied to work on the project and then narrowed that down to three. And then my wife picked the winner and uh, praise the Lord, perfect choice. Uh, this, the girl is amazing and really hard worker, uh, keeps on time every week, consistent schedule. So we do two or three illustrations per week. And I just send the text each week, ideas, maybe an old picture from Pilgrim's Progress and say, can you make something like this? Change this pit part and then we'd revise. And that was the, the process. Wow. Beatrice Mello, where is she located at? Yeah, in Brazil. So, Brazil, okay. Yeah. So, Canadian author, uh, uh, working as a, a, a missionary in, in, in Cambodia. Uh, yeah, yeah. also beginning a publishing company, working with yeah. a Brazilian illustrator. This is the new world, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's amazing. You just like there were times I'd need a little thing done, like even uh, we needed to vectorize the cover, for example, like all the text to make it gold foil. Uh -huh. And so then I think someone in like I don't know Saudi Arabia vectorized it for me. It's like just super random, like, oh, can you do this in 24 hours? Can you trace this by hand digitally? Yeah, yeah, can do that. Okay, thanks. Back to what is something you said a moment ago. Uh, that, you know, obviously you wanted to glorify the Lord in this, but the Lord used a desire in your heart to want to minister to your son. It's often mm -hmm. that way, I think, with particularly Christian artists uh, or, or, or authors, that they, they want to leave something with their they're motivated by their children to want to, yeah, to yeah. find ways to, to share the gospel. It, 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 that's really the heart of what you're doing here, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And it's actually recently, I've been thinking more about that since I'm working at, on part two, spoiler. Uh, but the thinking about my sons and all the mess in the world that especially 2020 has revealed the, the mess of human hearts, hostility, division. Um, yeah. Just start fear, everything. The whole gamut has been revealed, which John Bunyan navigates in these stories in very powerful ways. And I've thought, if I died, what would I want to leave my kids? How would I equip them for what's ahead? And and I thought, this book is it. That's uh, like, if, I, if I'm thinking about my, my four-year-old, my two-year-old, you know, one month old, um, if I was to go, I'd want them to have these books in their hands so they can navigate even the four through 10 stage uh, in this crazy world. Wow. Bunyan's day was not uh, any easier, if not harder, right? I mean, yeah, he, he was true. in prison when he wrote <laughs> this book <laughs> for uh, 12 years. And there were religious wars and there, were, there was turmoil. And there was times he had to go into the forest to preach the gospel. And, um, you know, we, we, particularly in North America, where you're from and I'm from, We've had it pretty easy, haven't we? Uh, yeah, yeah. Does the does this story perhaps um, speak to us today here in 2021? Yeah, in a huge way. Uh, like it is the reason it stuck around. I mean, the Holy Spirit inspired John Bunyan in a powerful way to create just a masterpiece. But the even there's places like the Enchanted Ground where the pilgrims get sleepy. And uh, they're feeling like just, it's kind of like they're easing into complacency and yeah. just sort of giving up. So you have that kind of extreme and then you have the other extremes of yeah, dragons coming, attacking them, a giant taking them to a castle, locking them up, them contemplating uh, death, giving up, uh, hopelessness. So all of that is hit. And that's been the interesting part is, uh, I keep getting messages from uh, parents who are reading it. who are like, I was weeping at this part. And I'm like, whoa. Um, like, the book has been a blessing to me enduring the first you know, year and a half overseas and reminding 
the need to per, the persevere, like the, the hill of difficulty that was encouraging to me, just seeing him like press on when he wants to give up. But uh, different people have been pointing out, wow, this scene really like, I was just weeping when my kid, was, when I was reading this to my child and, and they've all been different, but that was the genius of the book is it deals with such powerful emotions and situations that it's relevant to, to all ages. And, and at the heart of it, and I know this is something that you care about, I care about, is Bunyan wanted to point people to Christ. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's really your, your desire as well. That's the only hope that we have, right? Yeah, yeah, amen. How did you keep the heart, uh, the main thing, the main thing, looking to Jesus? I've seen some renditions where it's like just the king and it's almost nebulous. It's, it's not jesus you know mm -hmm. and, and, and that really comes through especially even the the scene i forget uh let's see I, I think i marked it when um when little pilgrim comes to the cross oh yeah i marked it yeah. with your uh with your well let me let me i'll do the two here for the people here he is coming to the cross with his burden mm -hmm. and it's it's been heavy i mean it's it's already you know it almost kept him from leaving the city of destruction mm -hmm. It, it has, uh, you know, caused him to sink low and to slew to spawned and so forth. But right there, when he sees, yeah, yeah. when he sees the cross and the uh, burden is gone, um, what, you know, what, what sort of process did you go through? It's like, I want to make sure that this isn't mm -hmm. just a moralistic tale, but this is a story of grace. It's a story yeah, of yeah. Christ. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. The, um, that the cross scene was probably that's the one that it was like okay I need to hunker down and make this just perfect uh, get every, everything just thinking through every word every bit of it trying to okay how can I make this as clear as I can and capture the again the essence of what Bunyan was doing of pointing people to Christ and him alone uh, he alone can remove the burden so yeah thinking through that putting like. Um, like I put a little rhyme where he's saying, I, I kind of condense Bunyan's rhyme, but uh, that gets the heart of like some things that maybe kids haven't thought about, like that the king took, took his burden um, and he's given him his own righteousness. And, and I think he reflects, I should actually read it, but he reflects <laughs> like, um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn there so I don't uh, mess. <laughs> Page 71 for those who are looking at home wondering. Yeah, so Christian stood in wonder. I lived my whole life in the city of destruction. I continually disobeyed the king. I never once thanked him or showed him any love. I'm a poor little pilgrim in filthy clothes. Why would he do this for me? Um, so he talks about that, and then there's a rise. He says, I came to the cross with the burden of sin, for none could remove all the guilt held within. What a wonderful day. I've been covered by grace. For the king sent his son to die in my place. At the cross I am free. Here my burden's released. Here my shame has been thrown in a bottomless sea. Yeah. Amen. Uh, so, I mean, even I get choked up at times okay. reading over that again. Um, but the rather than just being kind of a vague, okay, he passes the cross and, yeah, Jesus died for you and his, or like the burden fell off at the cross and just kind of moving on to the next scene. It's like, let's, sit here for a minute, um, stand in wonder at what Christ has done and how that applies to us in our own sin, uh, in our own unworthiness. Uh, and I think even that reflecting on four kids, how unworthy we are of that and yet how amazing uh, Christ is to, to give that to us. Yeah, yeah that, that was a key part. And then the other piece um, that I think is unique to this book, I'm not sure if there's others that do it, is the summaries often, I tried to, uh, each each chapter has sort of a three paragraph or one page summary. Yes. That tries to point people to scripture and to Christ more specifically than you could potentially do in a story. So it's just lays it out more, okay, this is exactly what it's referring to. And Yeah. Well, I found that very helpful, uh, you know, just with my own family and uh, being able to, to engage with some questions and some reflection. And um, yeah, I think I, I'm glad you, uh, you did that. I think that that'll be very helpful for families because, you know, even, even though you, I hate even using this because when you, when people read this, it's, it, it doesn't feel like it's boiled down. I mean, you, yeah, it, yeah. that you made it, you made it your own. 
even though it's still bunions. You, I know you're yeah, not taking yeah. credit for it at all. Um, but there still needs to be time for reflection um, of what did Christian just go through? Why did he mm-hmm. go through that? You know, what, what led him there? Was it, you know, poor choices or uh, was it distraction? You know, they, they, yeah. that's what Bunyan's trying to say. Here, is, here are all the challenges you will face uh, as a pilgrim in this lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I noticed in the illustrations that I, I actually really enjoyed, and I'm wondering if this is something that you chose to do or if your illustrator did, is there are a lot of little animals. We're talking about that yeah, crop yeah. scene there. There's a little squirrel yeah. watching on. Uh, I marked another moment that really jumped out at me when he's leaving the city of destruction. Yeah, yeah. There's some cats following on the rooftop and some mice leading on the yeah, way yeah. out there. Is that something that you asked her to do or is that together you kind of worked on that? Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, there was, there were a couple of scenes she'd throw in an animal and I was like, wow, those look so, like, they're just, she does the cutest, like, kind of cool little animals. They, they have personality. They have, like, they're just fun. And uh, so it was in a few scenes. And then when we were doing the final, so once we finished everything, I went back through every illustration. It's like, can you tweak this a little bit, tweak that? Um, and then I was kind of like, could we put animals in about, like, half of the scenes? Like, just just if you see a part you can throw in another animal, that would be wonderful. And, um, and sometimes an animal reflect a character. So you'd have, like, a snake or a fox or a skunk or things that kind of – occasionally you'll see that. Uh, where it's like there's a deceptive character, like um, who is it? The what's his name? Uh, it's a weird old word. Flattery, flatter, flatterer. The flatterer. He he's there, and there's a wolf standing in the background behind a tree. So he's got a white cloak on over his black cloak, and there's a black wolf in the background, and it's kind of like it's sort of foreshadowing yeah. what kind of what kind it of person. It really works. It it's great, and, yeah. and it adds a. Uh, um, it adds a level to, I don't know about you, but my, uh, when I was younger, I loved reading Richard Scarry. Uh, he oh, yeah, an yeah. author and illustrator, and he had so much going on. It, there's the story, but then there's this sub story. There's this deeper context because he's creating a world. And I think I think you kind of nailed that. You've captured something that a kid doesn't just have to read the words. They're going to get pulled into this world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, and that, those animal details really added a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's fun, fun details. So with Let Those Kids uh, on your Facebook page, you say that we are an independent publisher producing biblically faithful and beautifully crafted books for kids. We were talking about this before we recorded um, that, you know, sadly, I think in eras gone by when it came to Christian publishing, Christian filmmaking, even Christian songwriting, um, the the level of excellence at times has lacked. And I hate saying that because I don't want to judge someone's work. Cause you know, but you were, if we were to like name an artist or an author and they, you know, they'd be like, well, wait, I, I tried to do good. And I, and I don't really know why at times it has lacked like a book covers just flat or a song is just, you know, Mm. one note. Uh, A a movie has, you know, just kind of more pantomime acting as opposed to, you know, engaging um and so i'm asking you this question because you put it out there that Mm. you want these things that you're producing to be beautifully crafted you want them biblically faithful that is so important um Mm. but why is beautifully crafted important to you yeah yeah i think families notice it kids notice it uh i think it it brings glory to god when we we give things our our best he's made us little little creators um he's given us that creative bent and so we got to do it the best like we christians should be setting the standard of work that glorifies god and so yeah with with this book i felt like i want this to be a kind of an heirloom copy my the reaction i want is someone opens the box and says whoa that is really beautiful um this, this is really beautifully crafted so that's where that that came from that it would be done with excellence and, and when you do things with excellence, I think they also they also last. And so that was the other piece that um, we've bought books from thrift shops and different places. And so that's that's just kind of a cool thing as a, a book creator to think, oh, 30 years from now, if the Lord hasn't returned, this might end up in a, a thrift shop and some kid might pick it up that I'll never meet. But uh, and maybe we'll encounter the cross for the first time and 
So things like that, that even this, the cover would draw people in the, the cloth cover or the gold foil, everything um, in that way. That's a beautifully crafted piece. And then uh, this just also came to my mind, the biblically faithful, how for at least 10 years ago, uh, I would say most children's books, children's Bibles, maybe it's going back 20 years, actually were leading people to uh, the town of morality. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Which in Bunyan's book is where Christian almost dies. Um, right. And is actually in, in the original Pilgrim's Progress is the most one of the most dangerous places he encounters is the town of morality because someone tells him you can go there and your burden will be removed easily. Um, you'll live a long, happy, easy life with decent people. And yeah. he goes there and he's calling out for a man named Legalist to remove his burden, but there's no, there's no Christ in that town. There's no cross. And so he tries to go there to remove his burden and nearly is destroyed by um, this, this mountain, which re represents the, the law that, would crush us without Christ. Um, so think of that biblically faithful, as we said, we want to point kids to Christ, which is the goal of all of scriptures. So if we're making children's Bibles, oh, we had, we have very limited access to children's Bibles here, which is uh, so sad, but the, we bought an Usborne children's Bible because it was, it was the only one we could find at a, a local store. And we started reading it and it was just like, you might as well throw this out. Um, wow. what, what is this? Unless you're taking it, and, and I tried to do that, but eventually it got so painful that I tried to explain things to my son in a better way or make up my own words. But everything's just pointing to morality. Morality, be a good person. This person was a good person. Oh, this person obeyed God. This person did that. So, man, no. <laughs> Scripture, uh, we are hopeless. Um, we are uh, enslaved to sin, and yeah. we constantly wander astray. Constantly. And we see that in this book, our proneness to wander, and yet there's grace to redeem us and grace to equip us to, to move forward. So kids can understand that, four years old. That's my big thing. I think kids can get that. And other authors, I'm not the first one to say that, obviously. There's like the Jesus Storybook Bible and many okay. other books. That there's really, a, I feel like, a, a reformation in children's literature right now. But um, yeah, kids can get the deep truths. Yeah. You're you're abs you're absolutely right. Now, for uh, the pragmatist, perhaps they might say, "Well, just sit down and read your kids the Bible, um, and, and just talk to them about that." Why would you say uh, that it's necessary for families and children to have access to stories, movies, music, TV shows that aren't just morality? Um, what, what is it about the aspect of storytelling that captures a child's heart is what I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, that's actually been a, a meaningful part of this is to remember how stories shaped me and stories, uh, just have a warm part of my childhood. There's that sweet where you're, you're actually brought back when you think of that, that nostalgia and that, that story that really impacted you as a kid or that book you yeah. love. So now it's pretty surreal to be now imparting that to kids because childhood is just such a sweet stage um, to be imparting something that will live in their, their memories and impact their souls um, for the rest of their life is shaping uh, like there's, I know I, I'd seen a podcast by Andy Wilson called the stories are soul food. And he mm. just talks about that idea that these stories actually really feed your soul that we're, we're living in the great story. Um, but now we impart little stories in that story to, to keep people, kids looking to redemptive themes and hope. Yeah. Um, so, and then to, if we're just to read the Bible, I'd say you can try. And if you, if you succeed with your four year olds and you're, you're an amazing, <laughs> if someone's able to do that, they're an amazing parent. Um, and if your kid has that attention span, <laughs> praise God. But um, I know for us, we've been very blessed by, uh, things that have been well done point to the gospel where kids can grasp it. And even the, the power of picture, I was just reading another book I'm working on to my son, um, just the text. And after about 10 minutes, he started to feel like, Oh dad, when are you going to be done? Like, but if I had picture, which we're pairing it with pictures, I was just trying to test the text on him. And he's like, just four year old. It's, it's hard for them to have that attention span. 
Absolutely. Well, think about our Savior. Uh, Christ came, and he knew the Old Testament, right? I mean, he could have recited from Genesis to Malachi word for word. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But when he engaged with people, he told them parables. Uh, and that's, that is, once again, his condescension, isn't it? He's coming down to the level of the people He's yeah. not backing away from truth, right? I mean, those stories were packed, uh, and yet they still, he was coming down and, and speaking to them, as you said, through, the, he's communicating the great story through these parables um, mm -hmm. that engaged people's imagination and, and, and made them really think. Uh, and, and we know some of them, uh, it produced repentance. Yeah, yeah. So we, I guess in some ways I'm answering my question too, the, uh, that those who might be pragmatists and say, well, just sit there and just, just read the Bible to your kids. It's like, you need to, you, we, we have to condescend to our kids, you know, a four-year-old, a five-year-old, they don't have the attention span. But then if you open up a book and, you know, are, are explaining to them the story, I'm flipping over here to, uh, we were talking about it at the beginning, Napoleon here. Yeah, yeah. And that's going to capture a kid's attention there. Wait, that's yeah. a dragon dad. Wait a second here. Uh, I don't know if he was like a dragon dragon, you know, like, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's great. The cool thing with this has been, uh, which I, is, is somewhat surprising to me. I'm not sure. Maybe I, sh I shouldn't be surprised by it, but um, there aren't many kids books that are like an epic adventure that actually goes on for like this book's 200 and something pages and has 10 chapters. But kids have been like, like parents have said, uh, their kids are engaging in, with this in a way that they haven't with other books and they're just obsessed with the picture. They're, they've used words like trans, transfixed or it's, it's drawn them in or their kids have thought like they haven't been able to read books to their kids before but they started this one and they're like oh this will last five minutes and then they read for an hour and their kids yeah. like right there. Uh, so that, that's something I've been thinking about a lot is providing things of this length and quality and meaning to kids that can just draw them in and again, draw them into the greater story and, and bring their hearts towards uh, those crucial themes of hopelessness and grace. And then the eternal yeah. everlasting hope that lies before all who trust in Christ. Without a doubt. Uh, you know, I know that I think I was in second grade when I first came across the story and it had a profound impact. I, you know, I, I don't want to say, I don't want to over exaggerate it, but yeah, it, yeah. it had, a, it had an impact on my life as an eight, nine year old boy. Uh, and some of it was the epic story, but then the fact that there was this man named Christian mm -hmm. who was seeking to stay faithful and pressing on towards the celestial kingdom. I mean, you don't ever lose that. Uh, and yeah, and you're reminded yeah. that, yeah, there will be challenges in this life. Um, but if we keep our eyes on Christ, uh, he will see us through that. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just such a, a message that not only adults need to be reminded of, but our children need to be given that hope. Yes. Yes. At a young age. <laughs> yeah. That's mm -hmm. great. Well, um, you, you hinted at it, um, that you've got a couple projects. Is it uh, a young, uh, Christiana or a young, yeah, yeah. A young Christina, I think is her name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, no, it's funny. Her name is actually Christiana, which is, is kind of hilarious. It's just add, adds the A onto the end of the name. And so, uh, yeah, John Bunyan wrote part two of The Pilgrim's Progress, but probably one of every hundred people that have read Pilgrim's Progress have read part two. It's not very well known. Yeah. Um, and it's not quite as great um, as the first one. Like this one he wrote in jail under affliction. The second one was more like, hey, what happened to the, like people just kept asking, what happened to his wife? What happened to his kids? He's like, oh, okay, I should, I should write something to, to close this story. So, um, yeah, I'm taking that one, and I learned a lot in this first one about adapting the book. And so I'm kind of taking that and adapting some of the pieces to having more freedom with that book, but keeping the same uh, Bunyan flavor. And really loving, loving the process this time, especially now that I know it's just super smooth this time. And uh, a lot of... There's so much you can do with this format, like, uh, and this this main storyline that uh, there's just some amazing characters that come across, different lessons, unique angles. Um, so I'm excited about that. That's great. Well, look forward to that. 
Is it going to be another kind of a year-long process for you, do you believe? Uh, yeah, so I started uh, a couple months ago. So I'm about a third finished in terms of illustrations and then uh, released about the same time. So in the fall, fall 2021, maybe September, October-ish. Wonderful. Well, we'll look forward to seeing that for sure. Well, Tyler, I can't thank you enough uh, for, for joining me um, today. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is a blessing. Absolutely. And, you know, it's just uh, as one one creative to another, one Christian to another, it's just uh, encouraging uh, to see that um, not only can you start a project, but you can finish one <laughs> and you can finish yeah. it well. Uh, yeah. so, so good job on this. And, um, you know, it's been a blessing to read to my kids. They too are like, can we read one more chapter? No, no, <laughs> we need to move on. <laughs> we, we'll get to the next one soon. But um, uh, yeah. it's just great to hear from you that so many around the world are being blessed by it. And and I know you're translated into other languages and you have a heart mm -hmm. to share it with the, the nation that you're ministering to and now. So we'll look forward yeah, to that's the exciting uh, exciting thing about being independent is we have the rights to everything. We can share them generously. And so we're, there's three languages we're looking at right now. And, and I'm actually able to use a portion of the funds from this to, to help move some of those things forward, which again is one of the blessings of starting this project is okay, how can we get this out to the world? Well, as Bunyan himself would have said, to God be the glory. Amen. Uh, so God bless Tyler. Thank you so much for joining us here. And uh, yeah, thanks, brother. Time soon. Yeah. Great.